Hello, this is Amos, the STEM guy with my wagon, with the STEM wagon right here. Remember, we're starting a movement with wagons of books on science and math. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the eclipse that is happening here in Texas. In Tyler, Texas, we're getting totality, and I'm going to do a live stream. So stay tuned. Email me if you want that link, but I'm going to have it on my stream yard, which will uh, do a live stream onto different channels, especially on YouTube. So please subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Amos, the STEM guy. Uh, on YouTube, you should be able to find me right there. Please subscribe and share with others. So what's in my wagon today? Well, we got a few books. Um, the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We have our Bible. We have, um, we're talking about the eclipse and astronomy today. We have books here on um, Leonardo da Vinci. This is just here to talk about the time period he lived in as we get into the period of the scientific revolution. But we have a book called The Scientific Revolution. We have all these books in our library that you can get. And um, we have CLEP preparation material, science books, and uh, science in the scientific revolution because some of the people behind understanding the solar system did their work during the scientific revolution. So stay tuned. During the live stream, I'll be talking about Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton. These are the people that gave us the fundamentals of physics and understanding of what we're going to be, uh, uh, you know, we're going to be witnessing some of that today. We also have some books that people at Oxford and Cambridge would have read back in the day. Like the, the history of Oxford is right here. We got Dr. John Lennox's book, 2084, which is a great book we'll be talking about on this channel. Um, I'm going to come back to a couple of these books in a second. And we have more books to inspire students right here. A lot of these books are re readily available in our library. Uh, the Return of the God Hypothesis, Dr. Stephen Meyer talks about the origins of modern science. Part of the origins of modern science is why we're doing what we're, how we're able to understand what we're understanding today. So let me talk to you a little bit about the origins of modern science. Uh, back in the 1400s, we get this thing called the printing press from a man named Johannes Gutenberg. Gutenberg did his work in Mainz, Germany. That's part of where he did his work. And after Gutenberg was able to get a system going, right, for the printing press, uh, it was able to create books and resources at a much faster rate than prior to the 1450s, right? Gutenberg unfortunately died not rich. He didn't make a lot of money off his invention, but his invention opened the door. And by the way, he printed the Bible. The first book, we have the Bible, and some of the original copies of the Bible can be found in places like Harvard. Um, pretty cool stuff. So Gutenberg did his work in the 1450s. A man by the name of Nicholas Copernicus comes in the 1500s, uh, or he publishes his book in the 1500s, which talks about astronomy and the fact that the sun is the center of the solar system, not the earth, right? So we get the Copernican revolution, which is an, uh, the right understanding of the solar system. So we get the printing press, and then we get the Copernican revolution, 1450 to 1550. And then in 1642, around 1650, basically, so 200 years from the printing press, Isaac Newton is born. Isaac Newton is born in 1642, the year that Galileo Galilei died, right? So Newton was born on Christmas Day of 1642, based on one of the calendars used at the time. There's two different birthdays that you will see for Isaac Newton. Now think about this. How many people do you know there are two birthdays, right? One calendar shows Newton born in January and one shows him born on Christmas Day of December 25th. Newton is such a big deal that we actually know about different calendar systems explaining his birth date, right? Newton was fascinating. Because of Isaac Newton's work in math and science, we start getting a mathematical explanation of the solar system. We didn't have an explanation of the solar system mathematically until we get the differential calculus that Isaac Newton was doing. Gottfried Leibniz in Germany also gave us some of the fundamentals of differential calculus. Now, why is this important? Because Newton gave us the language, mathematics is the language of science. Galileo and Kepler and all these people could have benefited from the work of Isaac Newton. There was a perfect time to be born as a mathematician. It was after Isaac Newton. Because after Isaac Newton, you have this field of study now that can better explain the universe. So calculus was... Part of why Newton did what he did in the 1660s was that he was trying to understand why objects fall. And he realized that the same force that is at work with objects falling explains the motion of the planets, right? So he, he said that, and it's fascinating. Stephen Meyer uh, quotes his work um, from the Principia in some of his talks. He talks about the fact that Isaac Newton said, though this system of the sun, planets, and solar systems, right, they operate by the laws of gravity, uh, uh, these planets are operating by gravitational force and so on, based on what Newton knew at the time, he says this system of the sun, uh, planets, and solar system 
could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Isaac Newton believed that God was involved in the understanding of the universe. See, John Lennox helps us explain this well in his book, Can Science Explain Everything? And also in his book, uh, Can, Has Science Buried God? God's Undertaker. John Lennox explains that there's a mechanism at work, but there's also an agent. So when people hear Christians talking about science and faith coming together, they sometimes think that the Christians are saying we shouldn't talk about the explanation of the planet. No, that's not what we're saying. Understanding the explanation of the planet is like you looking at a car, like a, a Ford or a Toyota, and saying these are the laws that govern Toyota. But it doesn't explain where the Toyota came from in the first place or why the Toyota exists. A famous example John Lennox uses is that when you go to a birthday party and there's a cake, you can explain the physics of how the cake came to be. You can explain the chemistry and all of those details, but you can't explain why there is a piece of cake in the first place. Then somebody else has to come and reveal it to you and say, that cake is for Auntie Matilda. And because of Auntie Matilda turning 70 years old, we've baked her a cake. The revelation is part of what Christians are talking about. God revealed himself to us. God has revealed himself to us through Jesus Christ. But he also reveals himself through us through the universe and his handiwork. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God, right? The heavens declare the glory of God. There's something called the fine tuning argument of the universe. The fact that all these planets and all these distances all matter, right? God created these things with exactitude and precision, which we can then calculate, right? The question becomes, how did the universe come to be with such precision and, and, and specificity at a large scale if there was not a creator? It takes a lot of faith to believe that it came together by chance, right? We're going to be talking a lot more about all these topics in our live stream, science and faith and astronomy and so on and so forth. So, let's land our plane. Isaac Newton came in the 1600s. He died in 1727. He stopped doing math for the most part later in his life. Um, he wasn't doing the rigorous math that he did when he was younger. As a matter of fact, from 1661 to 1665, he was at Cambridge University, Trinity College. Uh, that was where he, you know, during their whole, they had a plague, a, 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 a bad situation, a pandemic, so to speak. And during that time, he came up with a lot of uh, things that we talk about today, right? When we had a pandemic in 2020, a lot of kids were just trying to finish TV shows on Netflix. I'm not picking on the people of today, but I think we need to change our priorities. We should have read more books during the pandemic, for sure. But Isaac Newton came in the 1600s. And then in the 1700s, we get, we get Leonard Euler, who did an exceptional job in mathematics. He's the most well, I mean, he's, he's written the most when it comes to, comes to volume, Leonard Euler. But in the 1800s, there was a man that was born whose name was James Clark Maxwell, a Scottish mathematical physicist. And James Clark Maxwell did some work in understanding black body radiation or actually understanding uh, the, the rings of Saturn. Let's start there. He did some work with that. He was able to explain what the, the composition of the rings of Saturn was. And James Clark Maxwell actually is one of the people that explained that light was electromagnetic radiation. So James Clark Maxwell had calculus on his side, and then he did some things we call Maxwell's equations, some amazing work in Maxwell's equations. And what's fascinating about Maxwell is that he was good friends with Michael Faraday. Uh, this was given to me by the Swenson family. Thank you, Joe and Lauren. This is a great book called Faraday, Maxwell, and the Electromagnetic Field, right? So we can understand the physics of electromagneticism but here's what's fascinating about people like Maxwell. People like Maxwell would have also received some sort of education on logic as well as biblical theology. These two books are written from uh, Isaac Watts, who was out in England, as well as John Owen, who went to Oxford. So back then, scientists learned about theology at the same time. America, the world, we need to do that again. We need to allow scientists to also understand some theology. There's nothing wrong with that. They should still do their science and do it well, but there's nothing wrong with trying to understand the philosophy of science and why things are even here in the first place or, or how to make sense of the universe and the meaning of life. Those questions are not answered in science itself. Those questions are answered ultimately from studying the history and philosophy of things, right? Studying philosophy to think about those issues because those issues matter especially in this day and age where a lot of people are trying to uh, uh, have good mental health and wellness, they need to be allowed to explore understanding life outside of science itself. This idea of scientism is discussed in a lecture I gave in Chicago, which I can link in the description. So I wanna encourage everyone to make sure that we put science discussions, we should still have science discussions, but we should be okay with having science and faith discussions in terms of what is the origin of the universe? What kind of field can we go to to learn those topics?
The Return of the God Hypothesis is a great place to start on some of these discussions. I'll leave you with an analogy I came up with years ago in my book, Christianity 201, The Pursuit of Excellence. Um, so I've written a few books. Some of them are math and uh, uh, tools for mastery mathematics. So you can also look at that. I also have curriculum for math. For everyone from K-12, we have curriculum. We actually use Singapore math for the uh, uh, elementary school students. And so I'll be presenting some more resources to students in Singapore and Indonesia, Malaysia, Nigeria, Ghana. But then I also have this available for American students. It's a good summer review course. So American students, if you want to stay fresh in your summer math, I, got, I have your materials ready. Just send me an email, amosthestemguy at gmail.com. So here's my analogy from years ago. I basically said when you look at a computer keyboard and you push Control A, it highlights all. When you push Control C, it copies all. When you push Control uh, uh, X, it cuts it. And if you push Control Z, it, un it will do undo. Isn't it interesting that those keys have been programmed to work a certain way? But the thing is, we haven't answered the question of who programmed the keys. God created the world and he, then he has given us the opportunity to study the world he has made. The eclipse that we're experiencing today is just a glimpse of the world that God has created. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, right? And then it says in John chapter 1 verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. My friends, the eclipse is cool, and I'm excited to, see the, to experience the eclipse. But ultimately, I want to leave you with the question, What are you living for, and what is the meaning of life? And I believe that it can be found in the one who created the world. So, turn with me as I read through, if you want, through the Bible, start in the book of John if you want, John chapter 1, and you can gain more insight into the creator of the heavens and the earth. Take care, and I look forward to seeing some of you at the eclipse viewing later today. So we're a couple of hours out from it. Stay tuned for more. God bless.